Um, first announcement I would like to make is about our um, Bible class, which will be beginning Wednesday, June 10th, um, it's, and it will occur at 2 p.m. I'll uh, show you a photo of this here. Ready to see? Uh, what is the Bible? Um, where? In your living room or wherever you like, because it'll be through a Zoom call. Um, and it's a study of what the Bible is, how it was put together, who wrote it, how it was understood through the ages, and how it may speak to us today. Pretty broad and sweeping, and we'll be covering a lot of territory. Um, but uh, and it'll be, it will be accompanied with a PowerPoint um, presentation, like I'll be showing slides like I just did there. And um, then the video, the recording will be made available for whoever wasn't able to join us at 2 o'clock to listen in on, on your, your comments or questions. Um, so that is June 10th. That's uh, a week from this coming Wednesday at 2 p.m. Um, Connie wrote me a very informative email yesterday. If I might announce that the, ju the food pantry will be back and open on June 6th, um, Saturday, June 6th. Uh, I'm going to go pick up food on Thursday. Um, it's very important that those who are volunteering are um, people who aren't at high, higher risk of uh, serious effects um, and symptoms from COVID-19. And so I have put out some messages for uh, people who aren't a part of our church who are looking for ways to help in the community. And I've gotten um, a, a handful of people who are wanting to participate and to help. And so um, that will be good. Of course, everyone has the freedom to make their own choices as it relates to um, your, your own personal safety. Um, I'm looking at, um, well, lots of you who are volunteer. I won't, I won't name names, but, um, um, but we will be wearing masks and we will be using three volunteers on Saturdays and of course on Thursdays, putting pre-packaging things and whatnot. And then the last isn't so much an announcement, but addressing a question that I keep getting um, and it's when will we be back in our building? I get it probably a handful of times every week um, because of course we have now the, um, the, the, the green light, I guess it were to, to enter back into reopening our building. And my answer to that is very frustrating to some probably, um, but it's, we'll be back when it's safe for us to be there. Um, even as things are now, people who are over the 65 aren't supposed to meet. And when we do meet, it's supposed to be for like 45 minutes, no time before, no time after, no singing, everyone wearing a mask, no children allowed. Um, and when, when, when you put it all, all together, I see myself as kind of standing by the sanctuary door, trying to wonder if, if I'm putting people at risk or should I turn someone away if it's like, you know, Lester who goes home to Janelle and could I work up the nerve to do that? Probably not, <laughs> you know? Um, so the leadership council will be talking about um, this, this coming um, leadership council meeting um, on, I think it's the fifth. Uh, no, no, the, the third. It's a week, no, from week. week from Tuesday. And so, um, um, I'll keep you updated on how that discussion goes. I'm putting together a presentation of where I'm coming from. I, I'm as a pastor in a congregational church, I don't have autocratic authority. So this is going to be a decision to reopen that we will make with the leadership. And there are several churches in the area that have put together very reasonable plans that seem to fit and match our context. And um, Downey Avenue, for example, put together a really good plan um, for your information. They are not meeting yet in person and don't have plans to in the foreseeable few weeks to months. Um, but they have a plan about what it will look like and what criteria need to be met for that. And so um, you will hear more on that. As soon as it is safe for us to be together, um, we will be together with bells on. I don't know what that expression means, but I've heard it before. Um, <laughs> With that being said, um, I'd like to pray a prayer of Pentecost, a prayer for Pentecost. Um, and I'd like to read it to you. It was written by my friend, Brian Shivers, who's um, he's a pastor at um, Second Presbyterian Church. Um, he was a mentor of mine when I was in seminary, and he, he often writes some of the most beautiful words um, in troubling times. And so um, I won't ask that you... Um, repeat after me or anything because of how garbled it gets with this Zoom format. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and um, mute everybody and um, 
when it's time to share, just remember to unmute yourself. A prayer for Pentecost. Rushing wind, fill our entire house. Send tongues of fire to rest upon each one so that their voice is heard and their language understood. Come, Holy Spirit, blow down the walls of division and ignite the fire of justice in our hearts and our feet. For our black sisters and brothers who have endured far too much for far too long, may our anemic thoughts and prayers be turned to powerful organizing and action and may we work to see your justice roll down like waters, your righteousness flow like a mighty stream. We pray knowing you hear our hearts and not just our imperfect words. We pray knowing you stand for the marginalized and the oppressed. We pray knowing you will ask us to act with courage and love. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Now, I'll share a song that Sharon. like to open up for a time of sharing our joys and concerns and prayer requests and remember you've been muted so you'll have to take yourself off mute should you want to share i have something to share mm -hmm. my my granddaughter Ramy got home from uh, taiwan friday night safely and from her study abroad and we're having a, a social distancing masking brownie event this afternoon in their deck outside <laughs> so to celebrate that 
and I won't have, I haven't seen the rest of the family for weeks now too. So it's going to be a nice time, carefully safe, nice time. I'll also say, nobody else jumping in, Ed and I had our 19th wedding anniversary this last week. And there's a deck that, um, that the program director put him out on. It's a screened in deck on the third floor. And I was down on the floor waving at him frantically and hollering at him, happy anniversary. But I had brought him a, a McDonald's shake. And he was much more interested in that than he was in this Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was mostly for me anyway, and it was better than, than not getting to do anything at all. Well, I have some, I requesting prayer for my family and friends. I have a very good friend that is a pastor in Jamaica that passed away yesterday from the COVID-19. So can we all please, and they're also a disciple in, in Jamaica. So please, can we all keep them in the prayers. Okay. I, wanted to, okay. I wanted to say uh, my uh, mom and stepdad celebrated their 27th anniversary on uh, Friday, and also my birthday's tomorrow, and then I'm going to be going up to Kokomo to visit my mom's side of the family, as Friday is my mom's 57th birthday. Oh, happy so. birthday. Happy birthday. Happy Thanks. birthday. Thanks. I like to, I wanted to um, say for this is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. And um, we are in a perilous time, and um, I think prayers are needed um, not only for the community um, of of not mar not only marginalized of the community of others, community of neighbors, community of loved ones, um, and this act of um, and being. Uh, the, the gentleman that was um, insensitive and uncaring and an act of violence um, was targeting a, a young man. However, I don't think it's just, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I just want a, a prayer for, you know, yeah, for the community. Sorry, Michelle. Francis is probably being asked a question in his, in his um, hospital. He's in the hospital, and so he's on the yeah. phone there. So he's probably – go ahead. I'm so sorry that you were interrupted. No, I just want to make sure that we do pray, not only just for the, the, the young man that was um, killed, but not only for the community, for our community, for community of others, not only for marginalized, but for all communities that um, during this perilous time that – you know, we're, we're finding ourselves, you know, um, not able to feed our families or not able to, to um, endure uh, two to three months without work or, and, and things like that. So, um, but I do know that God is um, here with us and that the community of Northwood um, is an inspiring community. And um, I want things to look upward and um, because of what the what's going on in the city, mm. we need to pray for our city and other cities that it, that is um, rioting. But um, oh, yes. we need to pray for leadership because um, one of the things I see that's different, and I want us to pray for, is that when the '60s and the civil rights were marching, to me it was the Lord that was leading with Martin Luther King, who was a pastor, and I I don't see leadership. So I, I think we need to pay, pray for that leadership, that Jesus be at the will, instead of all this violence that's going on today. So, I'm looking for hope. So hopefully we will um, see more hope in the community than we have seen in the last few days. I, I second that um, call 
for hope. Um, right now, it all feels like a kick in the gut. Um, and communities, of ver various communities are fractured. I thank you for, for pointing that out and lifting that up in prayer. Well, if there are no other uh, joys or concerns, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody again and, uh, and, and pray. Almighty God, I lift up Northwood's um, congregants in prayer. Those of us who are not well in body or mind or spirit, God, I, I pray that your spirit will bring about uh, a healing touch on this Pentecost Sunday and that those who um, are not well in body will be made well and those who are not well in their, their, in their hearts or in their minds will, will be healed. And I pray that you will um, continue to bring us together in these ways that are very... Um, really a blessing um the silver lining of these times as we as we bond together through phone conversations and zoom calls i pray um for the city not only the city of indianapolis but our country as we are going through this absolutely um chaotic time where cries for justice and conflict on the streets and destruction of the downtowns of American cities. God, I pray that you will give the church the discernment to know what to say into this mess, but then also to know um, what the message is that we are meant to hear um, through this, these very loud voices. Um, I pray, God, that you will give us the discernment to know what to do with these cries for help in these shouts of anger. Um, God, I pray that you will give, uh, give me the words to say in the coming weeks and give other clergy the words to say to be uh, leaders in uh, this new movement and push towards justice for our black and brown Americans. I pray these things in the name of Jesus, and we pray the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um, this week, I'm going to be showing you the pre-recording of my sermon um, that I recorded on uh, yesterday, seems like ages ago, um, for reasons that I'll explain now. Um, yesterday, I went downtown. Um, I went downtown to, to march because, for two reasons, I wanted my kids, I wanted to be able to tell my kids um, what I did in this time that I didn't watch it, but I, 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 I at least bore witness, if not um, added a positive voice um, to the movement. And um, we, when I got down there, um, it was a fairly jubilant atmosphere. There was singing, there were, of course, chanting. And um, uh, if somebody were to, to say something unhelpful or unproductive, the people who had organized it would quickly put a stop to it. And um, and seven o'clock came, which was when the mayor had asked that people leave. But it was still a bright and sunny day, and it didn't feel like like we should leave. I it's hard to describe. Um, it was just a bunch of people walking down the street. I didn't see any police at that time. Um, children were walking with their parents. Um, we didn't feel like we were doing anything wrong. Uh, but also there's the history of curfews as it relates to the civil rights movement and the way curfews have um, been used by governments to, um, well, anyhow, um, I later watched like the coverage of what happened through the night and um, 
and I watched also live too. So some of my friends were still down there live streaming. I'm trying to uh, bear witness, not to loot. Um, so I remember reading the Indy Star this morning that they said that um, the tear gas was a response to um, looting and that the people there were given an order to disperse. I can only tell you what I saw. So maybe there, there's certainly another angle on this, but I was walking south on Alabama and I got to Market Street and I was chatting with a friend, everyone wearing mask distance. And the first indication that I had that something was off was when gas canisters started blowing up. I was maybe 35, 40 yards from where the police were there. The first time I had seen police actually throughout this process. Um, and at that point, it was chaos. Um, there was no putting the cork back in the bottle. We didn't know where they wanted us to go. We didn't know where the safe streets were to run. And people just scattered in all directions and people like me made for their vehicles and, and left. Um, I later was told that maybe someone threw a water bottle and I saw a video later that seems to justify that that did happen. That somebody threw a water bottle. Um, but I, if there wasn't an, an order to disperse, I did not hear it. And what proceeded to happen through the remainder of the night as I watched and was um, talk, chatting with friends who were there um, was what you all saw on television. Um, and so I made Kelly two promises that I wouldn't get arrested and I wouldn't get tear gassed. I kept one of those promises. Um, I, like you, um, are, my heart is broken. Um, I watched some of the places that I love downtown get um, damaged. And I resonated with the people who would try to bring it back to a, the message, which is um, systemic reform of how policing is done and embedded racism in our institutions. Um, and by the time I got home, I was so shook up. Um, I realized that I, I don't think I'm able to preach my message today. I don't think I could get through it without collapsing in tears. And so I, um, I, pre I have the pre-recorded version. I'm going to play it for you. And, um, and I think, I think it will get, the, get the points I want to get across. And, um, more, most importantly, I think it's time for us to listen. Um, there were some people downtown that seemed to fetishize chaos and anarchy. So you have to ask what kind of communities cultivate that kind of love of chaos. That's one issue. It's a spiritual issue, it's a community issue. And then there are others who I believe were so angry. Maybe it's the um, same thing that I feel when I wanna punch a wall. I know that it's not a productive use of my energy and won't have the effect that I want it to have and I might have to um, eat crow as Kelly reprimands me and tells me how dumb it was to do. But to understand how the physical manifestation of anger comes about and what drives it is the real issue. It's not how dumb was it to punch the wall, it was why did you do that in the first place? That's really all I can say. Um, I'm gonna play my sermon. Um, and if you pray for me, I, I will pray. I'll continue to pray for you. I'm about to read from a rather lengthy passage, maybe take me a couple of minutes to read through 
from the second chapter of the book of Acts, verses 1 through 21. But before I do, I should say that I'm recording this sermon on May the 30th, uh, after a week of tumultuous living, um, chaotic times, um, a man was killed by a police officer in Minneapolis named George Floyd. I'm sure you've heard about it by now and uh, was caught on camera and it was, um, it was murder. And the aftermath has been uh, quite loud, uh, rioting in the great American cities all across the United States. And last night here in Indianapolis, uh, people downtown after a full day of peaceful protesting um, began to damage storefronts downtown and, and bust out windows and, and graffiti on things. And um, to me, I think it's just another example of that old adage that violence begets violence. You can spend a lot of energy condemning violent actions and say things like, um, two wrongs don't make a right, which is true. But oftentimes the second wrong is a result of the first wrong. And violence is cyclical in nature. I'll stick with what I said. Violence begets violence. And so rather than cast judgment or speculate about what ought to have happened, what we would have done, it would be better for us to try to listen to the cries of anger and frustration, the wailing, the mourning, the desperation. These are the acts of desperation. These are <clears throat> not actions that we should spend most of our energy condemning, but rather trying to understand where it's coming from. It's what I believe. And this happens on the cusp of Pentecost Sunday, the Sunday where Christians remember and celebrate the pouring out of God's Spirit on the people, the Spirit that enlivens the church to this very day, casts for us a vision for the future, and empowers us. And I'll say more about that later. But it was also seen, this coming of God's Spirit, as a time of great change. It was believed that when the Spirit came, the, the context, the circumstance, that point in history would shift and an old age would be overwhelmed by a new age that God would usher in. Again, more on that in a little bit. But if there was ever a time where maybe God's people had a sense that something old is being ushered out and something new is being ushered in, um, it's now. And so Pentecost and the things that it teaches us about God's movement in the world are more important now well, maybe I'll say as important now as they've ever been. It's always been important. So with that in mind, I'll move to the reading of the text. And again, I said it's a longer um, reading, but it, it's a great story. So please uh, listen in. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from the heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. At the sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter 
standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. A few words about Pentecost. It's the Greek word meaning 50th, and this is because it was celebrated by the Jewish people on the 50th day after Passover. And this was a festival of the harvest of first fruits. So it is placed in that part of the yearly calendar to tie in the harvest with what their expectations and hopes were for what God was going to do. And so this would be after a long growing season, and now it's time to reap the rewards and the benefits from the labor of humanity, of nature, and of God. And so by setting this Pentecost at the end of the harvest, it implies that the outpouring of the Spirit will happen at the end of an old age, an old order, a broken order, a messed up world, with the expectation that what breaks in upon the people is something new and vibrant and wonderful. So that's what is hoped for at Pentecost before the outpouring of the Spirit. That's what the festival was uh, in many ways uh, pointing towards. There are three components that stand out from this passage, at least to me. Wind, breath, right? That wind that comes in very loudly. Then fire, tongues of fire resting on the heads of each of the disciples. And then the speaking of different languages. And you could write a whole sermon about each of these things, but I'd like to touch on each of them in turn. First, you have the wind, the breath of God. The, the movement of the Spirit experienced as the wind, the breath of God. You can't see the wind, but you can feel the power of its effects. You can, you can experience it without seeing it. It was believed that breath was what animates people and animals, that those who have wind, air, spirit in their lungs are can be said to be truly alive you can't confine wind or bottle it up so sometimes god's actions are described as the wind you can't contain it you can't control it you can't channel it you can only get caught up in the current it's the best not to resist and it's god's spirit that fills the world and gives it life just as the air in your lungs gives you life god's spirit is what animates the world fills it with something healthy like oxygen and air for our lungs, but in this case, it, it animates all of creation. So the spirit is to the world as breath is to the body. And the spirit was understood to operate in five ways within Judaism. These were the assumptions the disciples would have carried into this experience. The spirit is a divine tool in creation and recreation. So in the beginning, when God creates the heavens and the earth, the earth is formless and it's a void, and it's God's spirit, ruach, breath, that's the Hebrew word, that's swept over the face of the waters. And it's that spirit that breathes life into Adam is the way it's phrased. And it's that same breath, that wind, that animates those dry bones in that famous passage from Ezekiel chapter 36. And so it is the breath of God, the wind of God, the spirit of God that creates and knits creation together, calls it into being. The spirit is universally present in the world. By the time the disciples experienced this, they would, have, they would believe that um, there was no place you could go where God was not. They, as the psalmist in Psalm 139 writes, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. 
It was believed also that it was the spirit that fills and anoints persons for special reasons, for special causes, for unique moments in history. And so in the book of Isaiah, the prophet writes in chapter 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then again, Jesus would quote that exact passage in Luke chapter 4. So the Spirit anoints and calls people to specific moments in history and then empowers them to be able to pull off what it is that they are called to do. And so you have Gideon in the book of Judges was empowered to lead the community. Moses was empowered to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Um, then you, of course, you have Joshua with that same kind of anointing and then David with that same kind of anointing. And really all of the prophets find themselves given more than they started with by way of the spirit, whether it's the words to say, whether it's the wisdom or the insight to see a better future for God's people. It's the spirit that empowers them for these tasks. And then lastly, and this is important in these times as we're trying to envision what a better future for our world might look like, the Spirit gives God's people a taste of what is coming. It's like a good dream or a daydream that might actually come alive. And sometimes it's a prophet or two that sees it sometimes it's a people collective that sees it and pines for it and hopes for it and fights for it and strives for it. Call these first fruits of what may come alive. So we have in the book of Joel, the, pa the passage that, uh, um, that people would quote in our reading from the book of Acts. Then afterward, pour, pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. I see a lot of this going on today. Even on the male and female slaves, the paupers, the poor. Again, I see a lot of this going on today. Could be what some of the rioting is about. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, says God by way of the prophet Joel, who is envisioning a better future and being enlivened and empowered by the spirit that we're talking about. So there's the spirit. Then you have fire. Fire comes into this story and not by accident. It, 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 when I was a kid, it just seemed like sort of a silly detail that they had these little tongues of fire on the tops of their heads and I didn't really understand why. But in Judaism, um, Fire uh, was a symbol of the divine presence of God, and in a unique way. Um, the Lord descended on Mount Sinai in fire. There was a pillar of fire that led the people through the desert, and Elijah expected to find God in the fire and was surprised when God did not come in the fire. Fire has long been seen as a metaphor for pent-up passion Passion about speaking up for God's judgment and salvation. So in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 20, verses 8 and 9, we read these words. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more of his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary and can not hold it in makes you wonder about the kind of passion and energy that we are seeing alive in the world today, sometimes as a destructive force, sometimes as a redemptive positive force, but it's, it's that fire in the gut that the prophets and those who are trying to evoke positive change have, are trying to channel in, in the fire like the wind sometimes you cannot control and, and it can be a double-edged sword as it as violence begets violence, or as fire cultivates new healthy energy. John says in the, in the book of Luke uh, that 
John the Baptist, that is, that he would baptize with water, but one was coming more powerful who uh, would baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. So that passion. And the fire also brings with it um, purification and judgment. The fire sometimes serves as the judgment, a refiner's fire, if you will. You are burned by it and you are changed by it, hopefully in uh, a good way. And this is not a nitpicky and legalistic judgment. It was a judgment of grave injustices, exploitation, greed, and de the degradation of those who are made in God's image. Today, the fire may be brought to issues like racism, environmental devastation, poverty, and our war economy. And I think that is exactly what we are seeing. Then lastly, other languages. So this, we have the theme of spirit, theme of fire in terms of passion and judgment, and now other languages. And this is not just a fancy magic trick. I remember reading it when I was a kid thinking, well, that's neat, but what does it mean? Well, we are supposed to think immediately of the story of the Tower of Babel that we read about in Genesis chapter 11. As you probably know, or maybe you don't, I'll fill you in, the Tower of Babel was uh, this, this tower that the people were building to the heavens, to ascend to the heavens. And um, pride and hubris drove the building of that tower. And so they were divided by language. They immediately could not understand one another. And that's um, supposed to be a, a metaphor for all times, really, that part of the problem that we face is our inability to understand one another. It's far more complex than languages. You could learn a language, but there are diverse cultures and ways of living in human community. And so the Tower of Babel story hints at a time before when we could understand one another, but pursued destructive goals. And then division, can't hear one another. And, and by that, you might also roll out and infer war and um, racism and all of the sorts of dividing lines that, that humanity has uh, placed between different communities. But when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit brings understanding, the ability to hear the other speak in their own language. And in this case, it's, it's quite dramatic. They actually can... Uh, forget those uh, those courses you might buy to learn a language over the course of a few months, um, Rosetta Stone or whatever. They are given the gift in the immediate moment, but it has been the work of Christians ever since, or it should be the work of Christians in every time, to try to find creative ways to understand and hear one another. And, and to do this, it's, it's a gift of the Spirit. The Spirit calls us to it, and the Spirit enables us to hear. I think that the results of the Tower of Babel, of course, are still alive today. Division with people, differences in language and communication, and this leads to a lack of empathy. We say in so many ways, learn the language, my language, the right language, as if there were a right language, or get out. But on Pentecost, the divisions are healed. Not because the differences are erased, but because they are rendered irrelevant as the Spirit of God provides a new way of relating. Differences are not erased. They are overcome. The text reads that Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phy Phrygia, Pamphylia, some of these are hard for me to say, but just the laundry list of all the surrounding countries. Egypt brought in, Libya brought in, Cyrene, Rome, Jews, and those who are not of that faith. Cretans, Arabs, all of them here, their own languages spoke and can communicate across the boundaries, the borders. It's a wonderful thing. It's not learn the language or leave. Instead, it's speak in your own tongue and by God's grace will come to understand. God's Holy Spirit will help us. That should be a prayer we pray again and again and again in these times where there seems to be so much division. 
So next, Peter addresses the crowd and he preaches a sermon. And he quotes from the second chapter of Joel, which we read a little bit of earlier, about men and women prophesying, even the servants, the slaves, hearing God's Spirit, or having God's Spirit poured out on them and, and, and prophesying. This is a time where, where differences of class are over, overwhelmed and overcome by way of the Spirit. They're all prophesying. Then he preaches about Jesus and how his death and resurrection gives life and hope. So even if tumultuous times end your life, there is hope for Easter, new life, rebirth on the other side. Again, a work of the Spirit. He goes on to explain that eventually the Spirit will pour out on all flesh. We'll all get it. On Gentiles as well as the Jewish community. The Spirit will restore relationships between women and men. Again, still a problem today. Females and males will prophesy. That is, they'll serve as leaders in their community and cast a vision for a better future. Young people will see visions for the same purpose. Distinctions between slave and free will disappear as everyone becomes the prophet and caught up in the current of God's Spirit. And the Spirit will lead them from the old way and into the new. This is an astonishing, astounding hope for our future. And this is what we are called to. The church is called to become aware of this Spirit that has been given to us and to live in light of the vision it casts and the gifts that it gives and the hopes that it paints for our future. These are the things that we believe were given to the church on the day of Pentecost. And if we believe that for a second, I think things would change quickly. I think the problem is we don't always seem to believe it or remember it. We fail to notice the movement of the Spirit and it seems to pass us by, just as the disciples failed to recognize Jesus as they were walking alongside him on the road to Emmaus. But if we allow God's Spirit to move in our midst, we will create a place where the divisions caused by the sin in our world will be bridged, and the wounds caused by violence, greed, and injustice will finally be healed. And it's time for the prophets of our time to lead others by way of the Spirit to a world where the fractured communities that we have are mended and the breach between us is repaired. So what is the Spirit calling us to today? Well, it's always calling us towards the restoration and rebuilding of human community. The Spirit, I believe, is even now calling newly anointed ones, prophets for these times, speaking truth and decrying injustice. And prophets are always fought against and despised in their time, decried by those who benefit by the status quo. And the message they bring isn't always pleasant. It's often very messy and confusing. Uh, there was one prophet in in the Hebrew Bible that was called to sit outside of the city and make a fire with his own excrement to signal that this stench is how God feels about the way the people are behaving. It's not always pretty, but it's important. I believe that the Spirit is empowering us and those for who too long have felt as if they have had no power, no gifting, and no volition of their own. I believe that the ones described in this passage that we just read, the, the slaves, the, the outcasts, the people who historically have not been a part of it, uh, the women, are being given the giftings of the Spirit, or have been given the giftings of the Spirit, and given volition and a voice. And lastly, and here is where we get into more contention and conflict. The Spirit, even now, I believe, is giving us a glimpse of a better future for our communities and all of God's children. 
I think, believe the Spirit is trying to lead us, as it always is, towards a way of blessing and a way of life, as Clark Williamson, theologian, puts it. So whether or not you want to be a part of this project is, I think, to wonder whether or not you want to be a Christian. The Spirit is here. God is on the move. I mean, isn't it obvious? So much is changing so fast. Cannot be happening in spite of God's intentions, but God always provides the currents that lead to life, even in confusing times. And it's the calling of the church, even today, to, with the Spirit, move towards a radical shift in human relating. Are you willing to work with the Spirit so that we might catch a glimpse of God's realm even now? And on the cusp of this great change, as I've been saying, it's sticky, it's messy, it's not pleasant, uh, it's scary. It's described by the prophet Joel, and here are these words, the ones that Peter read. It says that I will show the portents in the heaven above and the signs on the earth below. This is on the eve of the great shift, blood and fire and smoky mist which is exactly what Indianapolis looked like last night in so many other cities. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's, for the church to in these times discover what it means for us to call on the name of the Lord and to catch the Pentecost fire and spirit and respond to its call. So it's time for us to listen, to feel the movement and respond to the call. The time has come for the spirit of God to fall on God's people yet again. In fact, it never left us. We've just been sleeping. It's time for us to wake up and notice that God is moving. The challenge to you and to me, to us all in these times, is to think hard about what it might mean for you to get caught up in the current that pulls us to life. God is on the move. It is time for us to be on the move, filled with God's spirit and caught up in this current that by the grace of God pulls us to life.
time has come for us to take communion and then I'm going to hop off pretty fast because um, Faith in Indiana and the clergy involved with Faith in Indiana are meeting uh, downtown at the State House uh, for uh, a peaceful uh, demonstration in March. Um, it's supposed to have started at two so I'm going to come in at the tail end um, but I do want to get down there. Uh, just I, I pastors don't it's not that we're not supposed to ask for help but sometimes we, we feel like we are responsible for carrying um, the burdens of the community but um, this week just when you think about it give me a prayer my heart is so heavy and broken and um, and I'm afraid too I'm afraid I'm afraid and uh, I just, I need that spirit. Uh, I need that spirit to shore me up. But let's take communion with one another before I sign off. And then I'll leave the room open for you all to, to talk with one another. We do this because on the night Jesus was arrested, he took bread and after he'd given thanks for it, he broke it. And he passed it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is being broken for you take and eat in remembrance of me and in a similar way he took the cup he poured it out blessed it said to his disciples this is my blood of the new covenant which is being shed for the forgiveness of your sins take and drink in remembrance of me for as often as you take of the bread or drink of the cup you proclaim our lord's death until his return I'll keep you in my heart and in my mind throughout the week. If you need to reach out for any reason or if there's a prayer request that I need to know about or somebody is not doing well, um, please give me a call. I'd like to know how, how our folks are doing. And um, thank you for, for joining this morning, um, afternoon rather. And um, prayers for our country, prayers for Indianapolis, prayers for the leadership from the top down, um, prayers for clergy and people of no faith, prayers for everybody. Um, I, I pray that God's spirit will find us in this spot and give us a way forward. God bless you. Have a good week.